slideshow set up. I want to introduce our speaker. I'm going to get your slideshow set up, but while I do that, why don't you just say hello to these good people. Everyone should be very excited. Mark is going to spend about 45 minutes telling us about a place that was simply in its day known as the corner. That corner being the southwest corner, southeast, southeast corner of Crescent Heights and Sunset Boulevard. So why don't you just introduce yourself, I'll get your show queued up. Okay. I, don't know, I, I don't know if I can beat his introduction. Uh, Mark, my name is Mark Chevalier, as Richard said. Uh, I am an amateur historian, and my main focus for the last few years has been one building, which I won't be talking about today, uh, the, the Oviet building in downtown Los Angeles. On Olive and Sixth. Uh, in the course of my re woo, yeah, in the course of my research into the Oviet building, uh, I came across what I'm going to talk about today. It turns out that Oviet's connection to this place I'll talk about today is very, very incidental, but it's fortuitous that it led me to the subject, and I hope I hope you'll be enjoy as much as I have uh, the fruits of my research into it. Just one last thing to say, uh, what you're going to be hearing and seeing today has been almost completely forgotten uh, for decades, literally lost. Uh, the part about Schwab's, no, that's well documented, but almost everything else you'll hear about, this is going to be new. So tell your friends and spread the word after you learn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Huh? Let me, let me lower the lights. Okay, how was I? Was I holding it too close? No, you were perfect. Okay. How about I close this? Are there light switches over there? sitting down for this one so you won't really see me while I talk but uh, well hopefully it'll work out. All right. Today I'll be introducing you to a location, a place just across the street from the Garden of Allah. Geographically this place still exists but its spirit is no longer with us. Decades ago, it was simply called The Corner, a short block on Sunset Boulevard's south side, stretching east to west from Laurel Avenue to Crescent Heights Boulevard. The Corner had, among other things, its own panorama of characters that could have come right out of central casting. We'll be taking a good look at these men and women and at the extraordinary building where they gathered. In its heyday, their block was a nexus, arguably the social haven of movie land's long jazz age. But first I'd like to say a word about the term I just used, the long jazz age. 99% of America lost its jazz age in 1929, not Hollywood. In the 30s and 40s, it continued to produce much of what had worked for it in the roaring 20s. Glamorous stars and dazzling productions, nightclubs and ballyhoo, breathless romances, scandalous divorces, and careers made and broken by columnists. The long jazz age finally petered out in the 1950s when audiences turned toward television and a new met generation of method actors. But its legend lives on. So now let's pay a visit to the corner. Next. At the beginning of its 20th century life, the corner was just a bean field, but not for long. In 1905, it was developed as part of the new Crescent Heights tract and became known as Lot 1, Block C. By 1908, Lot 1 sported a new 20-room, two-and-a-half-story mansion with landscape grounds. You can just barely see its front yard's wall and sidewalk in the photo at lower right. 
next. Meet the corner's first character. A real doozy. <laughs> Ready for this? Ellen, Genevieve, Marion, McKinney, Irwin, Toomey, Teal, Paddleford, Howells, Fawcett. Better known as Mrs. Paddleford, America's villainous international love pirate. <laughs> She's forgotten today, but for nearly 40 years, this woman's escapades made newspaper headlines around the world. She began her career as a Broadway chorus girl and went on to drain the fortunes of three multimillionaires <laughs> while stealing from the finest shops and hotels on three continents. In between husbands, lovers, and floods of unpaid bills, Mrs. Paddleford served time in Blackwell's Island, San Quentin Prison, and jails throughout Europe. <laughs> Next. In 1917, with 20 years of scandal already under her belt, she married Dr. George Edgar Paddleford, a wealthy Los Angeles oil man who was oblivious to her past. To surprise his bride, Dr. Paddleford purchased lots 1, 2, and 29 of the Crescent Heights tract from A.J. Wallace, California's former lieutenant governor. Lot 2 included Wallace's craftsman mansion, which became the couple's new home. Mrs. Paddleford dove into the roles of society matron, club woman, and patroness of the arts. Meanwhile, next step. It began to dawn on Dr. Paddleford that his wife was more than he bargained for. In fact, as he later testified, she was, and I quote, a worldly wise woman who resorted to all the artifices known to femininity in order to snare me into marriage, later blackmailing me, and finally making me a social outcast. My wife was intimate with a number of men here and in other parts of the country and built them out of large sums of money under threat of exposure. She was, in sum, a masterful woman with a checkered career and a sinister influence. You think I'm kidding? Among other things, Mrs. Paddleford gave her husband's clothes, watches, and cufflinks to her multiple lovers as gifts. <laughs> She beat her son and her adopted daughter until they agreed to lie on her behalf. Oh my God. Next. By 1921, Dr. Paddleford had had enough and announced a separation. His resourceful wife immediately sailed with her children to Europe, where she filled 11 steamer trunks with items stolen from the five-star hotel she stayed at. <laughs> along with unpaid for purse, cowns, hats, and jewelry from Europe's finest shops. Thrown in jail in Austria and Switzerland, Mrs. Paddleford cabled her husband to bail her out. He refused and applied for a divorce. In order to pay off some of his wife's gargantuan debts to Los Angeles shops, Mr. Paddleford also began to sell off their house and lots 1, 2, and 29 of the Crescent Heights tract. Mrs. Paddleford returned from Europe and snapped back with a cross complaint, crammed with sensational charges of battery, adultery, and incest. She also refused to let Dr. Paddleford sell off her half of the Crescent Heights tract property. No matter, soon after arriving in Los Angeles, Mrs. Paddleford was arrested and jailed for grand larceny. She was released on her own recognizance, ran off to Mexico, and threatened suicide and extradited. <laughs> Needless to say, oh, I'm sorry, next. Needless to say, the court granted Dr. Paddleford his divorce, and Mrs. Paddleford's 15-year-old son, right there, asked the court for permission to divorce her too. <laughs> But that was not the end of the ex-Mrs. Paddleford. Right after the divorce, she once again stole her way through Europe, got to Egypt, and married a shipbuilder who owned three palaces on the Nile. He died mysteriously within a year. Mrs. Paddleford went on to commit grand larceny worldwide, go in and out of prison, 
She was San Quentin's first female inmate. Ooh, wow. And remarried once more. <laughs> Before being locked away for good in Tehachapi prison. Who, the warden? No, her. <laughs> no. <laughs> Where she died in 1941. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so goodbye, Mrs. Paddleford, and Godspeed. <laughs> you were the corner's first character, but not its last. After the Paddleford divorce, Lot 1 of the Crescent Heights tract passed through various hands. Manuel Palaez, a Mexican general who'd fought under Pancho Villa, had it for a year. By 1931, it belonged to developers C.H. Thompson and W.L. Easley, who decided to demolish the old 20-room mansion and build a large shopping center and medical building on the site. Their plan made sense. The corner of Sunset Boulevard and Crescent Heights bordered the city of Hollywood and the unincorporated wild town of West Hollywood, <laughs> where celebrity nightclubs and more sordid but upscale establishments were springing up monthly. Movie people with money to burn would drive through the intersection on their way to and from the studios and Sunset's many talent agencies. The corner could grab some of that money. Next. To design the complex, Thompson and Easley hired Alvan Nordstrom and Milton Anderson, two local architects whose tiny firm had dozens of commercial and residential buildings under its belt. Alvan Nordstrom was a native of San Francisco. Badly wounded in France during World War I, he'd spent part of his long convalescence in Paris, sitting in on architecture classes at the École des Beaux-Arts. Nordstrom became an architect after the war and settled in Los Angeles in 1928, where he formed a working partnership with Milton Anderson, a talented Iowan architect who was as taciturn as Nordstrom was gregarious. Next. The duo were successful from the start, working mainly in downtown LA, Mid Wilshire, Beverly Hills, Westwood Village, and Santa West Santa Monica. Nordstrom and Anderson specialize in Spanish colonial and Baroque structures. They design villas, office buildings, stores, grocery markets, and warehouses. You name it, they did it. On time and often under budget. And so when Thompson and Easley approached them in 1931, the duo were ready for the challenge. The Norman Romanesque Sunset Medical Building, better known as The Corner, was to have four stores, a grocery market, and a pharmacy on the ground floor. The second floor would hold doctors and dentists' offices with a shared waiting room. A tower would hold an elevator to take patients up to the medical offices, and a covered bridge walkway would connect the building's separated east and west wings. Behind the building, an outdoor court would hold 30 parking spaces for customers. Several palm trees would be planted in the front sidewalk. Next. So far, so good. But Nordstrom and Anderson's clients wanted more for their building. They wanted opulence. It was decided that the structure's front and side facades would be entirely faced in imported French tan marble and Italian burgundy marble. The mansard roof's tiles would be glazed a dark green. The roof gutters would be made of copper. The building's interior spaces would be paneled and floored in mahogany. In other words, it wore luxury on its sleeve. Mark, can I, can I interrupt you? Yes. Do you want to ask the people who knows what the first marble clad building in Los Angeles is? I'll bring it up in a minute. Oh, the... good. Perfect. Okay. Okay. When... Merit, right? Merit. Okay. When, when, slide 14, next one. When the Sunset Medical Building opened to the public on October 24th, 1931, Hollywood's local city newspaper devoted the first three pages entirely to the event. Every detail of the structure was reported upon. For some reason, the paper insisted that the building's style was English Georgia. <laughs> yeah, I, I beg to disagree on that. It's pretty French. The reporters were especially impressed by its marble facade and pointed out that only one other commercial structure in Los Angeles the 1915 Merritt Building downtown 
was covered in so much of it. Next. No, wait, we have to. Does anyone know where the Merritt Building is? Yes. Where is it? That's right, just down the street. So when you leave the, the talk, go look at the Merritt Building. It looks like the Parthenon. Is that what you used to get? Yeah, okay. No, that's uh, the Oviat Building. Okay, next one. <clears throat> and this is a composite photo of the Sunset Medical Gorgeous. Building in all its 1931 glory. This was the corner that most of Hollywood's legends would come to know and love. <coughs> Next. Afterward, Nordstrom and Anderson would continue to design all over Southern California and beyond. They moved towards streamlined modern and rarely lacked for clients. Nonetheless, the duo would never again receive a commission as grand as that of the Sunset Medical Building. Next. Why is that? Who knows? Who then were the corner's first tenants? Well, the building's east wing had the Spick and Span Bakery, a bread that never touched the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Habit Dry Cleaners and the Luthiger Beauty Shop. Upscale establishments they were, but none would survive the Great Depression. Thanks. This, uh, here, an injured but lucky man on the left had the East Wing's fanciest shop. His name was Richard Talmadge, and he was Hollywood's first celebrity stuntman. Wow. <laughs> Beginning in 1913, the Swiss born Talmadge was jumping off of buildings and getting his body parts broken. But that didn't stop him from being Douglas Fairbanks' stunt double and a movie star in his own right. Richard Talmadge would go on to direct dozens of movies over the years, and he did stunts in every one of them. In between jobs, Talmadge created and tended his very own flower ranch in Brentwood. Yeah. As a selling outlet for his flowers, he opened the Talmadge Jones Flower Shop in the Sunset Medical Building. And yes, the flower shop's delivery man was a white Rolls Royce. Wow. Next. Let's take a look at the building's west wing. And this is a very important one. Andrew Kennedy. Who was Andrew Kennedy? He was a Canadian pharmacist on the rise. He'd managed a drug store inside the prestigious Ambassador Hotel on Wilshire, and he felt ready to open an upscale pharmacy of his own. The new space at the Sunset Medical Building's northwest corner seemed just the ticket. Next. Kennedy worked with architects Nordstrom and Anderson to furnish its tall but narrow interior. They added mahogany cabinets, Art Deco hanging lamps, and a mahogany soda fountain counter with 13 mahogany stools. The soda fountain, its small kitchen, and refrigerators were state of the art. The space's walls were painted a fashionable mint green, and the terrazzo floor was mint green as well. Andrew Kennedy resolved that only the best products would be sold there, and the refreshments would be tastier than oh, go back. Oh, sorry. Tastier than the norm. But solo drug stores are expensive beasts to launch from scratch, especially during a depression. Unable to keep above water, Kennedy was forced to sell his pharmacy in February 1932, just four short months after opening. Next. Is, Which one? Is Alan, is Alan Schwab here? I wish. Oh, he, he told me he might make it. Oh, well. Which brings us to the corner's next four characters. The Schwab brothers. Jacob, known as Jack, Bernard, Leon, and Martin. Pharmacists all, they were the children of Abraham and Lina Svav, a Polish immigrant couple who changed the family's name from Svav to Schwab in 1921. Probably a good decision. <laughs> the couple's eldest son, Jack, was the first to become a pharmacist. In 1927, Jack and his widowed mother purchased the Arthur Thomas Drugstore near downtown LA and renamed it Schwab's. The whole family worked there and it became a modest success. A few years later, 
Lena's second son, Bernard, became a pharmacist as well. And she decided that the family needed a second drugstore. Andrew Kennedy's failing pharmacy fit the bill, and a legend was about to be born. Next. Jack and Lena were ready. They bought the Kennedy Pharmacy with all of its equipment in stock, but felt the need to make changes. Out front, they installed three large, opulent neon signs, added more mahogany cabinets, and extended the glass display counters. Over the next few years, four key ingredients came together and synergized to make Schwab's a colossal, lasting success. Unusually long store hours, practically limitless service, a pinball machine, <laughs> and a chronic hypochondriac who couldn't drive. By the way, I should mention that for the next minute or two, I'll be quoting very liberally from Christopher Finch's and Linda Rosencrantz's excellent book, Gone Hollywood. Next. Key ingredients one and two. Long hours and service in excelsis. Schwab's opened for business at 7 a.m. and closed at midnight. Back then, very few pharmacies were willing to do the same. And for movie industry people who got up early and got home late, this was a godsend. It gave them time to grab a Schwab's breakfast and prescription before work, or maybe a late dinner and a bottle of fine scotch after a long day. And from opening to closing, the drugstore's level of service to everyone was astonishing. What made Schwab special was that, in spite of the high quality of its medications, merchandise, food, and service, it was the opposite of exclusive, attracting people from all ranks of the film industry. Credit was virtually automatic. In fact, when the nearly penniless F. Scott Fitzgerald died in 1940, he owed Schwab's $21.68. Starving bit players could always be sure of a free meal. Agents and managers conducted business there, packing the three indoor and two outdoor phone booths. Next. Schwab's also served as an informal real estate office, providing an exchange for information on everything from cheap apartments to Beverly Hills mansions. When actor Charles Lawton arrived in town, Jack Schwab took him all over the city, shopping for a suitable car. Although it's not true that Lana Turner was discovered there, she did frequent the place, as did virtually every movie star in town. Guests at the Garden of Allah and digs nearby would call in, ordering cures for their latest hangovers, because Schwab's had its own delivery motorcycle. Next. Key ingredient number three. A slick little pinball machine. In 1932, pinball devices were just beginning to become popular. Few Americans had seen one. Schwab's was probably the first West Hollywood pharmacy to have a pinball machine of its own. It just so happened that Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd were early pinball junkies. <laughs> they would come to Schwab's for aspirin and milkshakes and then spend hours playing on its machine. Naturally, this attracted people who were attracted to Hollywood's two biggest stars. And thanks in part to pinball, Schwab's grew to become a hangout for movie industry types, both large and small. But then, disaster struck. In 1937, California State Attorney General declared an Armageddon against pinball machines. Yes, it's true, the Schwab brothers were concerned. They genuinely believed that the pharmacy would lose a lot of its customers. <laughs> the beloved pinball machine was taken out, but the customers came back anyway. Schwab's had weathered its first crisis. Next. Key ingredient number four. Hollywood columnist Sidney Skolsky. Though never as powerful and far-reaching as Hedda Hopper, Luella Parsons, and Walter Winchell, Skolsky was considered an unusually literate and accurate reporter and built up a respectable following of his own. Next. With no staff and using Schwab's drugstore, a hypochondriac's ultimate comfort zone, as his office, <laughs> Skolsky worked on the run. 
hitching rides from home to Schwab's to studio to restaurant to party since he couldn't drive. Next. The reporter spent so much time at the corner and promoted it so much that for a few years it was re-nicknamed Skolsky Square. <laughs> and one of Sydney's later columns was titled Sydney Skolsky Sounds Off from a Stool at Schwab's. <laughs> Next. The man himself nicknamed the drugstore the Schwabadero, a winking <laughs> reference to a nearby celebrity nightclub called the Trocadero. Next. No greater honor could be bestowed on a Hollywood hangout than to include it in a Hollywood movie. And that's just what director Billy Wilder did in 1950 when he featured The Corner, and especially Schwab's, in two memorable scenes of his classic noir movie, Sunset Boulevard. The film's down-at-luck protagonist, screenwriter Joe Gillis, describes the pharmacy thusly. I drove down to headquarters. That's the way a lot of us think about Schwab's. <laughs> kind of a combination office, coffee clutch, and waiting room. Waiting, waiting for the gravy train. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, William Holden. <laughs> next. <laughs> Leaving Schwab's, we move next door to the left, to the Crescent Heights Market. Its longtime greengrocers were Japanese immigrants Frank Oye and H.G. Kato. You can just barely see the two of them in the center right of the photo. During World War II, they and their children would be sent to internment camps, but when they returned, the market's grocery stalls were waiting for them, and the Oye and Kato families began anew. Next. In the late 30s, the Crescent Heights Market was purchased and managed by our next character, the world's crankiest man, Ben Rubin. A Brooklyn nightclub promoter, he arrived in Los Angeles in 1937, moved into a ranch in Encino, and bought the market. No one knew why, least of all him. <laughs> next. For the next 15 years, the Crescent Heights Market would be as crazy and colorful as Schwab's. Ben Rubin's motto was, service with an insult, and, and the customer is always wrong. And his movie star patrons loved it. Ben would complain day and night. He didn't put price tags on anything. Instead, he'd call out the amounts as the items were being rung up. The richer and snobbier the customer, the higher the price. Film industry people would work there for free, just for fun. Robert Mitchum, already a star, liked to play stock boy. Starlets would spontaneously dance on the checkout counters just to get a rise out of Ben. It was, in short, a party in a grocery store. Next. Finally, there were the coroner's medical and dental offices upstairs, and their most colorful tenant was yet another character. Dr. Frank G. Nolan, osteopathic physician and surgeon. Dr. Nolan had begun his career as Columbia Pictures studio physician. He caught the Tinseltown bug and would thereafter be known as Hollywood's doctor, with patients ranging from Lucille Ball to Errol Flynn. Next. Though by most accounts a very able physician, Dr. Nolan first achieved gossip column fame as a man who loved the wrong actresses. Their happy moments will not last long. Next. Marriage number one. <laughs> Marriage number next. Marriage number two. Note that it says their plans are indefinite in the second picture. <laughs> not a good sign. <laughs> next. <laughs> On a whim. These two nearly got married at the Brown Derby, but no dice. Not even close to marriage, but a lot of fun at last. <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> Hang on. 
<laughs> no marriage, but a lifelong doctor-patient friendship. When a drunk Errol Flynn passed out after a midnight romp with two script girls, it was Dr. Nolan whom he called, after waking to find a rubber band wrapped tightly around his badly constricted manhood. <laughs> a house call... <laughs> <laughs> a house call, a shot, and a careful snip of the rubber band set things right. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Aside from gossip column divorces and star treatments, Dr. Nolan invented a wacky device that made breath visible for movie scenes taking place in cold climates. Okay. He also took care of the so-called topsy-turvy boy whose intestines were in his chest cavity. Yeah, never a dull moment for this man. Next. And now we meet our final character, Martin Belosov. Born in Russia, Belosov arrived in New York in 1924. By the 1930s, he owned a prosperous wholesale costume jewelry company in LA. And by the 1940s, he lived in Beverly Hills and was turning toward investing in real estate. Hard-working and pious, Martin Belosov was a tireless philanthropist for Jewish charities and hospitals. He was not the kind of man to seek trouble, but in the mid-1940s, trouble found him, and in a very big way. Next. Oh my God. On July 7, 1946, <laughs> Howard Hughes crashed an Army Air Force prototype airplane, the XF-11, into two houses in Beverly Hills, which were right across the street from Martin Belosov's home. Howard Hughes nearly died. No one on the ground was injured, but the whole neighborhood was badly shaken. Next. One year later, on June 20th, 1947, several mobster hitmen ran up a driveway of a Beverly Hills house and shot to death the gangster next door. Oh that God. gangster was Bugsy Siegel. And the driveway belonged to Martin Belisov. <laughs> it was Belisov who first heard the shots and called the police. The bullet casings were found on his driveway's floor. This was not a good way to start the summer, again. So the Belisov family decided to move away to Upper Beverly Hills. Around the same time, Martin Belisov's property investment company purchased the corner. Howard Hughes and violent mobsters were a thing of the past. Next. Well, not quite. <laughs> oh no. A few years after the plane crash, Howard Hughes moved to the Chateau Marmont Hotel, just a stone's throw west from the corner. Paranoid that his sweets phones were tapped, Hughes would drive a battered Chevrolet down to Schwab's, sackfuls of coins in hand, and use the pharmacy's outdoor payphone, sometimes for hours. Hughes would constantly send his many mistresses to the corner's brush wave beauty salon for treatments, so that he could give business to the bosomy beautician, the bosomy brunette beautician, who worked there. Thanks. Belisov didn't quite get away from gangsters either. Mickey Cohen, a former lieutenant of Bugsy Siegel and an ex-boss of the Sunset Strip, was fresh out of prison and looking to give trouble. He gave it twice to two Schwab's employees right inside the pharmacy, though only one of the scuffles was reported. Cohen, who had once been a boxer, knew how to give a bruise. Lucky for Belisov and for the corner, the mobster soon went back to prison. Mid-century had arrived, but the corner wasn't feeling it yet. Life there went on much like it had since the 1930s, and why not? The going was good. But times were about to change. A new post-war world was poised to render the pre-war one obsolete and to wipe out much of its traces. In the end, not even the corner would be immune. Next. To be sure, Schwab's was as popular as ever. Too popular, even. Herds of people would stampede into it at night. The Schwab brothers got into the business of crowd control, and it became harder for them to simply fill prescriptions. 
A solution had to appear one way or another. Next. And it did. In 1949, Martin Belisov was approached by a businessman named Mort Burton about renting a section of the vacant lot next to Schwab's, where those outdoor payphones were. Burton wanted to build a tiny coffee shop which would abut the pharmacy's west wall. It would be called Googies, and its quirky modern design would soon give rise to a new type of architecture. Next. Googie's look was the work of John Lauper, an architect who had studied under Frank Lloyd Wright. Here's how critic Douglas Haskell described Googie's look. It starts off on the level, like any other building, but suddenly it breaks for the sky. <laughs> the bright red roof of cellular steel decking suddenly tilts upward as if swung on a hinge, and the whole building goes up with it like a rocket ramp. There is another building next door, so the flight stops as suddenly as it began. <laughs> Could you see William Shatner saying that? <laughs> With tongue firmly in cheek, he adds, It seems to symbolize life today, skyward ambition blocked by Schwab's pharmacy. <laughs> next. Owner Mort Burton's goal was for Googies to draw in the excess crowds outside Schwab's at night. After a few years, the coffee shop began to attract a new breed of actors. James Dean, Dennis Hopper, Rod Steiger, Pierre Angeli, Natalie Wood, and Marlon Brando. When Dean died in 1959, 55, ghoulish look-alike fans decked in jeans and red windbreakers began to hang outside the place night after night. In life, James Dean had frequented Schwab's as well as Googie's, but the ghouls were barred from the drugstore. <laughs> Next. It was now 1955. Mid-century modern design was conquering West Hollywood, and Googie's style of commercial architecture, once the exception, had sprouted up all over the place. To the Belisov family's property company, and to the Schwab brothers as well, the corners look like Hollywood's long jazz age, was now a relic whose era had drawn to a close. It was time, they felt, for an extreme makeover. <laughs> Architects Armit and Davis, kings of Googie-esque structures, were hired to redesign the corner's exterior facade. The plan included replacing the covered bridge walkway between the east and west wings with a bi-level glass wall suspended box. This did not come to pass, but the plan's other elements were carried through. The tower would go. The covered bridge walkway would go. The mansard roof would go. And yes, the marble panels would go too. The work began in December 1955 Schwab's never closed throughout the remodel. Next. After, oh, I'm sorry, let me just look at that for a second. You see the roof is gone. Okay. Next. And after the mansard roof, tower and bridge, the marble went away. Next. Meanwhile, Schwab's did two things. It remodeled its interior, and it expanded into the space next door that had been occupied by the Crescent Height Market until the early 50s. That space would now hold the pharmaceutical section, other merchandise, and the soda fountain counter. The drugstore's original space would now hold a Schwab's coffee shop and an expanded kitchen. A small upstairs office was created for Sidney Spolke's use. <laughs> to create the new look, Schwab's hired Ralph A. Vaughn, a pioneering African-American architect whose client list crossed the era's racial divide. As these 1956 pictures show, Vaughn was a master at mid-century modern design. One surviving and very similar example of his work is the interior of Cantor's Deli. Fairfax. Wow. And there 
there's the outdoors. There's that was the right wing. Or it is. A vocal coterie disapproved of Schwab's new look. Actor Rod Steiger complained that the drugstore had been turned into Macy's. <laughs> Screw keeping up for the times, he ranted. You got a place that's world famous and perfect, don't screw with it. As far as I'm concerned, they just killed everything that Schwab stood for. Well, by and large, Steiger was off the mark. Entertainment industry types, both the leaders and the strivers, continued to frequent Schwab's, if not the rest of the corner, for three more decades. The new interior was more spacious, better lighted, and certainly up to date in mid century modern style. But Steiger's point had some truth too. The rubbing of shoulders, the cramped, improvised, cozy conviviality, the marble and mahogany pastiche that so belonged to Hollywood's long jazz age was gone forever and would never, could never be revived. Next. Schwab's Pharmacy finally closed its doors in 1983. What was left of the corner would last a few more years, only to be demolished for good in 1988. By then, the chateau it had once been was already virtually forgotten. Until today, that is. Thank you very much for letting me introduce you. to Nordstrom and Anderson's lost architectural treasure and the characters attached to it. Please spread the knowledge. Help us all to recover this grand, vibrant corner of our city's heritage. Come on. doing research into the history of the Oviet building, and I had found out that in 1923, uh, the men's clothing store, Alexander and Oviet, had laid a claim on uh, the land where this building would be built, the corner. And I misread it at first. I wasn't familiar at the time with legalese, and I thought it indicated that uh, Alexander and Oviet's store was going to build a branch store on the land. No, what they wanted to do was uh, get a piece of the land when it sold because Mrs. Paddleworth had stolen thousands of dollars of stuff <laughs> from Alexander and Oviet's store. So they, so they put a claim on it and actually they, they never did end up getting any money back. Uh, Mrs. Paddleworth had the last laugh. So that's, uh, that's how I ran into it. I, I eventually figured out that no, Alexander and Oviet was not going to open the store there. But then I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, what's the story behind this little corner? And that's how it all began. Wow. Uh, serendipity. You're, you're not done. Um, are, are there are there any questions? We'll take we'll take a couple. This is an inspired presentation. <laughs> no. Yes, yes. Oh, hi, mom. My mom has a question. Are you gonna are you going to talk about the fact that your favorite pharmacist is Alan Schwab? Yes, and he has pharmacies at 435 North. Right, right, okay, so in just... The back, in the back. Um, I got it, okay. <laughs> Schwab's Pharmacy is alive and well. It's on North Bedford in Beverly Hills. It's between Wilshire and Little Santa Monica. Alan Schwab is there every day. It's a very nice man. Alan, Alan Schwab is one of the sons of uh, Jack Schwab, the, the original founder of Schwab's Pharmacy, the eldest brother. And uh, if you go looking for this pharmacy, it's really hard to find. It's t 
tucked inside a building down a long passageway to the right. It's one tiny room. Believe me, you'll get lost. Don't look for a sign on the outside, you won't find it. But it is the last of the Schwab pharmacies. What I didn't mention in my lecture is that Schwab's at one point had seven different branches, including one on Hollywood Boulevard near Vine. Um, but they're, they're all gone now. Yeah, that's another thing. When Schwab's finally closed in 1983, um, the Schwab brothers, who were almost all of whom were still alive, sold off everything. Uh, except one of the Schwab sisters got to keep the sign. And uh, yeah, it's it's now on Vine Street. Any other questions? Yes? Will the Sunset Boulevard interior shot inside? That's a good question. Um, just about every historical account you'll read about uh, the making of the movie Sunset Boulevard says that a movie set was constructed of the pharmacy's interior and that it was very accurate and that that's where it was filmed, the interiors were filmed. That's half true. There are two scenes in the movie that show Schwab's. The first scene is very brief and that actually was filmed inside the real Schwab's after midnight. In fact, uh, the head pharmacist of Schwab's, a fellow uh, named uh, Sam Baswell, you can actually see him go by a couple of times. You only see like the back of him, but it's him. Uh, the second longer scene in the movie that features Schwab's was filmed on a movie set uh, that looked just like the interior of Schwab's. Any, okay. Yeah? What corner is it? I'm trying to visualize Okay, I'll help you out on that. Uh, if you know anything about Sunset and Crescent Heights, you'll know there's a very, very large building that ha used to have a Virgin Megastore, the Virgin Records Megastore. And yeah, that building is built on the site. That building was built in the early 90s, after they tore down the original building, which would be the box. Anything? Okay, good. So, so Mark, I'm not going to let you get away just quite yet. I just, I know everyone wants to know what's next. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what you're talking about. What next is uh, I'm writing slowly, but I'm writing a book on uh, a biography of James Oviatt, the man behind the Oviatt building. Uh, and uh, I would like to take this little uh, presentation I gave you a little bit on the road. I'd love to give one to the uh, Hollywood Heritage Foundation, for example, Evening at the Barn, because I think that it, this talk has legs to it. A lot of this information was just completely lost. Uh, to give you an example of how lost, when I first started doing the research, I approached Mark Wanamaker and said, here's this building. Do you know anything about it? And he said, well, yeah, I have a couple photos of it. But I really don't know anything about it, except that it had Schwab's. And I thought, okay, if Mark Wanamaker doesn't know about this building, then somebody's, we really got to look into it. And, and that's what we've done. So, do you, just because I'm so involved in it, do you want to quickly talk about the, uh, the gaps in the Hollywood Historic Survey, which are really tragic? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, back in the mid to late 80s, West Hollywood did a, a little historic survey uh, and it covered buildings that it thought were of historical interest. Well, this was still here at the time of the survey, but they did not cover it. And the reason why they didn't cover it is because they looked at it and said, this is an ugly box. <laughs> they didn't remember. Nobody on the survey team knew or remembered that it had been once that. So it wasn't covered, it wasn't researched, it wasn't documented. It was just passed by. And, uh, you know, there are other gaps too, but that one frustrated me. All right, Mark, I want, I want to thank you. Thank you. Imagine if someone wanted to buy you a cup of tea, you're, you're, you're around for another 10, 15 minutes? Mm, I gotta make a late lunch. Okay, okay, so if you want, they want to talk to you, find you now. I want to thank everyone for coming. I, I want to take a second uh, to look ahead. Mark, thank you. To look ahead. Um, 
next, so we're going to come back next month for July, and we're going to have two presentations. Uh, the first presentation will be about Max Senek, and our friend Brent Walker will talk about Max Senek, both as an early filmmaker and a booster of Los Angeles. So we'll start out with a couple clips from early Max Senek films, and Brent's great. Also, our dear friends uh, Didia and Paul are going to talk about uh, the false claim of the first neon sign in Los Angeles. They're going to in America. In, in America, thank you. They're going to debunk a, a misconception that the first neon sign, Nathan, help me, the first neon sign erroneously claimed to be a Packard dealership sign at, Se at Temple and. Uh, at, 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 at what is now Olympic and Hope Street which has commonly been considered to have been that, you know, Earl C. Anthony was over in Europe and said, oh, neon, this cool thing, let's make a Packard sign, put it there, boom, 1923, first neon sign in America, Los Angeles, and we're all very proud of it. However, wrong. Wrong. however this long held, long beloved idea, just myth, is being just tossed out the window. So everyone come back and July and find out what, what, what the reality is. We're, we're looking forward to it. So I want to thank you. Uh, we have a crime lab between then and now. Lava has a crime lab uh, at the Cal State LA Crime Lab. It's in your flyers if you have a flyer. Also, before Paul and Media and Brent's talk, we're going to have Raymond Chandler's birthday party at the Los Angeles Athletic Club. This ties in to Mark because Mark Chevalier is going to help us because we're going to go over from the Los, An Los Angeles Athletic Club is 7th and Olive. Raymond Chandler is a member of the Athletic Club. Raymond Chandler wrote extensively about the block on Olive between 7th and 6th. The Oviat's next door to the Athletic Club. We're going to go over to the Oviat and read the opening passage of Chandler's fourth novel, Lady in the Lake, which is set at the Oviat building. So that's a lot of fun. It's all in your flyers. That's it. I want to thank you. Uh, oh, what, Kim? No, we have a podcast. Yes, we have a podcast. Thank you. Listen to our podcast. That's um, that's on the Esoteric site. The podcast is a lot of fun. Um, we've interviewed Mark several times. We interviewed a lot of fun people. So I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to encourage you to keep coming back, and and we'll see you very soon.